Okay, thanks everyone for joining, those attendees who've been able to log in and the panelists that have managed to come in and join us. Um, this panel is going to be a facilitated discussion. This is one of the virtual side events of the ECOSOC Humanitarian Affairs segment, which is based on the theme Strengthening Humanitarian Assistance to Face Challenges of 2021 and Beyond mobilizing respect for international humanitarian law, inclusion, gender, innovation, and partnerships. So in this panel, we'll be looking at where the data on humanitarian crises comes from, um, which is the humanitarian data ecosystem, as we're calling it in this panel. The past decade has brought us some pretty huge advances in the use of technology and data to really improve humanitarian action, but realizing the full potential of this approach requires a renewed investment in responsible data, um, infrastructure, human capacity, increased localization and empowerment so that people are really active participants in this data ecosystem rather than being the subjects of data collection. Um, humanitarian operations are very complex, they're often urgent, they're very hectic, so this area of work isn't always that easy to navigate. This panel is being co-sponsored by the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data, the International Rescue Committee, and the International Organization for Migration. And today we'll be joined by a multitude of experts who are used to navigating this space. I am your moderator, and my name is Sandra Wantegia Hart. I work for Emerging Impact as co-founder and CEO of Advisory Services. And what I do is I work at the intersection of emerging technology and the humanitarian sector. So without further ado, I'll introduce our panelists. We've got Godfrey Takavarasha. So he's a data manager at the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data. We have Nuno Nunes, who is the global coordinator for the displacement tracking matrix at the International Organization for Migration. We also have Annalisa Brusati joining us, who is the Director for Country Support at the Violence and Violence Protection and Response Unit of the International Rescue Committee. And we have Kendra Delusul, who is the Country Director at World Vision Vanuatu. Uh, a reminder to those in the audience, again, apologies for any connection issues, but please put your questions into the chat only. Uh, and panelists, just a reminder on time limits, uh, you will be given five minutes for your first questions, and I'll give you about two minutes for the second round of questions during the moderated discussion. So just a reminder to keep it tight, uh, and that less is more so that we can have the time to discuss between ourselves and, of course, quest it allow questions from the room. All right. So. The first question here is for Godfrey. So this is a question around data gaps in the ecosystem. So according to your experience at the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data, where do you think that the humanitarian data gaps are most pronounced uh, and how can these gaps best be addressed? So we're talking about gaps in data quality, support versus capacity to collect, um, to analyze, to report, and maybe any tools or technologies that you might be aware of to fill those gaps. Over to you, Godfrey. Uh, thank you, Sandro, and a huge thank you to everyone uh, for joining us today. Uh, so my name is Godfrey Takavarasha. I work for Ocha Center for Humanitarian Data as a data manager. Uh, the Center for Humanitarian Data aims to increase the use and impact uh, of data in humanitarian response. And we focus on four areas of work. Uh, that is data services, uh, data literacy, uh, data responsibility, and uh, predictive uh, analytics. And as part of our data services work, we manage the Humanitarian Data Exchange, or HDX for short. Uh, HDX is OCHA's open platform for sharing data across crisis and organizations. Uh, last year, about 1.3 million users visited HDX and downloaded over 2.2 million data sets from the site. These numbers were driven in part by the COVID-19 pandemic, which saw unprecedented demand for data in the humanitarian community. Unfortunately, sometimes this demand was not always met, uh, exposing new as well as lingering gaps in data availability. Uh, HDX 
currently hosts thousands of humanitarian data sets that have contributed to the platform by close to 300 leading humanitarian organizations. As the go-to place for humanitarian data, uh, HDX is a useful proxy for measuring data activity and availability on a global scale. We measure data availability on HDX through a concept we call the data grids. The data grids are a limited uh, human curated set of foundational data sets that place the most important crisis data into six categories and 27 subcategories. Uh, the categories include people, um, affected people, coordination and context, geography and infrastructure, population and socioeconomy, and so forth. We carefully create a data grid for each of the 27 countries that have an active interagency humanitarian response plan, such as Afghanistan and Zimbabwe. When we curate this data, we evaluate how well the available data for a subcategory meets certain operational requirements. We classify categories that fully meet operational requirements as complete and those that only partially meet the requirements as incomplete. We also take note of those subcategories for which no data is openly available. And based on the results of this curation exercise, the Centre publishes an annual State of Open Humanitarian Data report, whose goal is to increase the awareness uh, of the data that is available to inform humanitarian operations around the world as well as to highlight what data is missing. So in last year's uh, report, we estimated that just over 50% of relevant complete crisis data was available across the 27 humanitarian operations that we curated. For this uh, data, we thank our partner organizations who contribute and share data on HDX, such as the International Organization for Migration, uh, UNHCR, WFP, Rich Initiative, to name just a few. However, across uh, all locations and subcategories, 25% of uh, all data is missing. Another 25% only partially met uh, operational requirements and was considered in incomplete. This represents the data uh, gaps. Um, this is, of course, a global overview figure that disguises wide variations in data availability across locations and across data subcategories. For example, Chad and Mali shared the highest level of data completeness at 70%, while Ukraine and Zimbabwe had the lowest completeness rates at only 26%. Uh, I will stop here for now, uh, but I look forward to engaging on some of these points later in the QA session. Uh, thank you and back to you, Sandy. Thanks, Godfrey. Um, the next question is for Kendra. So based at the field level in Vanuatu, and this is a question about local data use. Um, so my question for you is how local stakeholders engage with new technologies, guidance, and tools around data, and what sorts of demands uh, are placed on local and national NGOs and other humanitarian stakeholders at the field level um, to collect this data to meet these demands, and what sorts of support or obstacles are they facing? So specifically really wanting to hear from you on where can local humanitarian leaders be better empowered to benefit from data collection and analysis as this ecosystem, you know, requests it from us. Sandra, um, I think uh, first I'd like to introduce myself. So as Sandra said, my name is Kendra and I've been living in uh, Vanuatu for about 20 years. Um, and uh, working in the Pacific more broadly for that period of time. So a lot of what I'm going to say is going to reference my experience in Vanuatu and, and, and the broader um, South Pacific region. Um, and uh, if you don't know where Vanuatu is, um, we're located somewhere between Fiji and Australia. Um, and it's a very small country of about 315,000 people. And um, it has also been ranked the world's most disaster prone country in the world um, by the humanitarian index, at least five years running now. We have um, earthquakes and volcanoes and tsunamis and um, cyclones and uh, you, you name it, uh, we've got it. So uh, disaster response is an ongoing and um, 
ever present need here. And um, I think what I'd really like to speak to in response to your question, Sandra, is a recent experience in responding to Tropical Cyclone Herald, um, which was a Category 5 cyclone, which impacted about a third of the country um, in April 2020. And I think there's a couple of slides. Yep. So, um, it, if you can uh, see on this slide, this is a high level uh, summary of some of the um, uh, relief items that were provided. And um, Kareem, can we go to the next slide? Uh, yeah, great. So this gives you an overall idea of um, how the types of data that we collect to inform some of the relief items that we distribute. Because Vanuatu is geographically quite isolated um, and still doesn't have electricity or running water very far out of the capital city, um, mobile phones really came into existence less than 10 years ago. But given the technological advances in the rest of the world, tablet-based information collection um, has become the norm because it's been very easy to pre-program um, information collection needs into a tablet ahead of a disaster, um, take it into the field, and then upload the data into a program when we get back to a Wi-Fi enabled center. So that's really the... Um, significant technological exam, uh, advance locally um, here in Vanuatu um, that may not seem advanced for other countries, but has changed the, the type of data that we're able to collect and certainly the speed at which we're able to collect it to inform our response. Um, there are enormous demands for data um, post-disaster uh, from the Vanuatu government. Um, to determine response needs for our own programming, as well as the donors that are funding the response, um, and also to ensure that we're upholding humanitarian accountability standards um, and data, international data requirements, um, much like Godfrey spoke about. And um, so, Karim, if you can move to the next slide. Um, you'll see that um, this gives a broad summary of the, the, the type of um, data interfacing that World Vision, who's delivering response uh, directly to uh, the affected populations in the field, will be doing at any given time during a disaster. So um, you can see that uh, weekly sit reps were sent out to as many stakeholders as possible. Over 20 staff um, attended 19 regular weekly coordination forums. Um, 26 distribution infographics were shared back to the communities that received a response for some of that accountability towards community information collection. But I think particularly what I'd like to draw your attention to is that orange section at the bottom, which is that World Vision submitted three and four W's to five different clusters, which, the, uh, which our response was geared towards in four different formats over eight weeks. And generally that was multiple times a week. And so if you can imagine as a field facing organization, um, we were not only trying to mobilize funding to respond to the urgent needs in the field, but um, we were also having to uh, constantly keep this data stream up, which took about a third of our staff at least eight hours a week. Um, and so I, I guess the point that I would like to make to finish is that a lot of data gaps, at, at least in this region, are often due to um, lack of communication or coordination between the various um, stakeholders and partners that are collecting data after an emergency, and, and we know that, that it, it can be chaos um, because there's been a humanitarian crisis, um, but that lack of coordination actually translates to um, direct lack of service impact in the field because staff time is taken trying to get that information out there as much as possible. 
So I really think that field facing organizations such as World Vision Vanuatu, but just NGOs and service delivery partners in the field would really be empowered by having a seat at the table from the very beginning to decide how information collection can be coordinated in a country that best suits the local um, uh, ecosystem because each country's ecosystem will be different and um, the, the, the NGO partners are often the ones that are there for the long term and working on long term development programs and projects as well as humanitarian response. And so, you know, I think my key point would be to say that uh, often NGOs are passed over in the data planning phase or in the first week after a disaster um, rather than um, having their UN um, colleagues or, or even government colleagues uh, say, please come sit with us, tell us how this could be better coordinated um, so that we can focus our time um, on delivering support in the field. Thanks. Thanks, Kendra. Uh, the next question here is for Annalisa. So Annalisa, in your work in violence prevention, right, and response, you're up close and personal all the time with the privacy of data, the sensitivity of data, and of course, this concept of data ethics and data responsibility. So my question for you is, you know, in your experience, what are the biggest concerns around the use and sharing of data in the humanitarian space? And how does it differ according to what sort of data your collection you're collecting? Uh, and of course, how does this push for kind of more and better data? How is that felt by humanitarian organizations and particularly beneficiaries in terms of their rights? So data rights and data ethics here, but of course the work that they have to do to keep the response running and to keep the response funded. Over to you, Annalisa. Thank you so much, Sandra, for the question. Um, and just to introduce myself again, yes, I'm Annalisa and I work for the IRC. Um, so it's so important when talking about data to ensure that we think through the risks and the damage that we can cause, both through the way we collect the data and how we use it, including how and who we share it with. So first, we need to really think about ethical collection of data. So how proportionality and purpose comes into that data collection. We have seen in the past decade, a shift towards the generation of use of big data. So large volumes of structured and unstructured data. However, a lack of accountability and little understanding of the unique risks associated with protection data have encouraged a movement among large donors to request more and even more specific data and this could potentially be damaging to individuals. So really we should focus on only collecting the data and information that we need for the specific service or to inform our program design. So let's talk about what this means in relation to true informed consent. We must ensure that persons understand why we're collecting their information, what we will use it for, who we will share it with and how we will protect it. So consent is not just a kind of tick the box exercise, but really an intentional conversation with the individual to ensure that they fully understand the steps, the purpose, the risks, and that they feel comfortable to say no. And what we often forget in the consent piece, especially around data sharing, is that it needs to be specific. And so that we may need to return to that individual data subject to ask for further consent for sharing data, for example, with new third parties. So in regards to the data use and protection, these must be guided by the principles of do no harm and need to know or confidentiality. So if data is uh, collected, stored and shared inappropriately, we can cause harm to the data subject or the population group who are real people. So for example, um, in East Africa, caseworkers were working to relocate one female survivor to a safe location. Before the relocation could take place, staff from the donor agencies requested that the survivor be handed over to the male community leadership to be held indefinitely at a male community leader's house. In the process of making this request, the donor staff revealed the survivor's identity and told the male leadership that the implementing agency's caseworker was at fault for the survivor seeking help. 
Now, thankfully, the survivor ultimately got to safety, but the violations of the ethical principles and of the commitment to do no harm in this case of wrongful disclosure are really clear. Failing to protect privacy and confidentiality can result in stigma and retribution. So ultimately will erode the help seeking behavior, threaten the reputation of service providers and put staff or vulnerable people at risk. Another example is that in a country in Asia, a donor requested proprietary access to personal and identifiable case management data. This violates the principles of need to know and confidentiality and it prioritizes liability over consent. So potentially bringing harm to survivors and staff if the over empowered donor staff take action on that information that they have received. And this also means that decisions could be made regarding clients data without their consent or knowledge as has been reported not just in the humanitarian sector but also in mainstream media. Therefore, how data is gathered, stored and secured and how and why they are shared with other actors demands diligence. To that end, IRC and other service providers have invested in building interagency systems and processes to ensure that data are managed in a safe and ethical manner. These include the Child Protection Information Management System, the GBV Information Management System, and the Protection Information Management Initiative. So inherent within these systems is a recognition that sound data sharing and reporting by donors and, and at coordination level can lead to multiple benefits by revealing gaps in programming, strengthening coordination, and identifying opportunities for advocacy to improve that programming. So each system includes clear and comprehensive data sharing protocols and practices. Finally, throughout all of this, what we must remember that we have minimum standards on consent, privacy and ethics for one reason. Refugees, displaced people have a right to be the masters of their data. However, saying that refugees are the masters of their data, but then determining for them and not with them what should be shared shows a lack of respect for consent and agency of these data subjects. So in a world where we are finally waking up to the need to decolonize the aid sector, I guess I leave you with just one thought. Many on this event today um, may be living in countries where GDPR governs the use of their data. So why would refugee data be less protected? If the examples I mentioned before were taking place in the global north, no doubt there would be objections and reforms would be demanded. And yet these compromises to client safety in the southern context continue without attracting this widespread outrage and without a push for reform to mitigate the risks and to hold those accountable to power. Thank you. Thanks so much, Annalisa. I love some of those words around respect, you know, consent, and honestly, the power divide when it comes to to these questions around who's requesting, who's controlling, uh, who's using this data. Um, so the next question is for Nuno, and this is around data coordination. So I'm sure many of us know whether it's you know in the panel or in the attendees that coordination can be a very complex and very thankless job sometimes, um, particularly with regards to data standardization, multiple stakeholders that you see in these responses. So do you mind just talking to us about what does data coordination mean in a humanitarian response and what sorts of challenges does it bring? Um, and you know, in the midst of these challenges, how can we strengthen our collective data responsibility in these operations on the ground? And of course, feel free to weave in any thoughts from the other panelists if you think those are relevant. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Sandra. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, Nuno, I'm the global coordinator for DTM. And just uh, perhaps to explain why we are so concerned with data responsibility, it's a network of operations with around, uh, at this point, 8,500 people in 86 countries, uh, out of which 650 are experts in different areas related to data, being its data management operations, analysis, uh, data security, et cetera. And in that regard, uh, the topic of uh, data responsibility, so the, the biggest, the, the achievement somehow, the, also the biggest, the, the risks uh, uh, for us, and we, we try to take it seriously. In um, 
I would like to quote something from uh, the signal code uh, from 2018, like this piece produced uh, by I see him online and uh, some colleagues from the Har at the time at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. Um, that said uh, something like how humanitarian actors address the absence of common ethical guidance and I would add here and coordination between themselves and with a wide range of actors that use the results from their work. Um, for the use of information, ICTs and data will determine positively or negatively the future of humanitarianism itself. And I find this uh, ultimately a, a sentence that was very inspiring uh, because it did what we can do uh, with data and especially in not coordinating well with each other can de facto undermine uh, core principles of humanitarianism. Um, it's very interesting uh, that uh, in uh, just in February 2021, also with colleagues from OCHA, HER, UNHER, and IOM, uh, finally uh, there was uh, the, the publication of a system wide uh, guidance, the IAC operational guidance for data responsibility in humanitarian action, which to some extent also <clears throat> identifies as a challenge for data responsibility, the uncertainty and lack of coordination. Um, in this case, specifically mentioning the development of new technologies and humanitarian data management standards and practices, uh, which uh, evolve faster than the policy instruments that govern their use. So with this, I think that we could try to structure, you know, like what, what are like for broad areas potentially impacted by coordination. There could be many more, but I think that in terms of accountability, efficiency, reduction and principles um, are perhaps summarizing some of them. So in terms of accountability, um, mm -hmm. we need to be much more accountable for all the data that we produce about people that are really vulnerable and are in need. Uh, there are enormous data sets, there are operations, including our, our own, uh, to produce data. And without the proper coordination, then, you know, not only on how the data is collected, but then downstream, how, how the data is used and utilized, maybe as Kendra mentioned, like to um, better support efficiencies in the systems. Uh, ultimately, we are not being very accountable for uh, all the data that we have. Uh, in in this case, I think that uh, when we we talk about coordination, we don't have like a four Ws. You know, who is doing what, where in terms of data for a country or in terms of data at a global level. And if we would try to do so, even for a small country, even in Vanuatu, perhaps we could end up like with a huge list of actors that are in country, but also actors that from abroad are uh, using, utilizing data and working around Vanuatu on collection, training, system, security, governance, you know, all these broad areas of data. Uh, in terms of uh, efficiencies, I think coordination would help to, you know, to, to increase these efficiencies uh, in on one way, um, uh, there are groups already for coordination, like this IAC uh, uh, guidance was produced through one of those groups. There is the data science and ethics groups. There is a lot of other groups around aspects of data, um, but uh, there is still a missing connection between them. Some of those groups are enormous, like with uh, the DSAG, the data science and ethics group that I follow more closely as around 100 plus people participating. So uh, reduction in the sense or efficiency uh, in the sense of uh, better connecting the units that exist within each cluster, the units that exist globally, the, 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 the capacities uh, from different universities and private sector and our own um, around one country or globally, uh, I think would be highly uh, proved. Reduction. Uh, in the sense that uh, so far there isn't a way of merging and combining efforts at a, a global level. There is like a, a, a one of our colleagues uh, uh, now at TL yesterday in uh, another panel uh, called as the humanitarian geeks, uh, the data geeks. And uh, to some extent, yes, there is like a combination of efforts that results from this geekness. 
but not necessarily works all the time. Um, also because beyond being geeks, we also work for the large institutions. Um, the donors themselves recognize to also be part of an issue during the Good Humankind Donorship meeting uh, a couple of years back, um, and that there wasn't there weren't like formal mechanisms through where investing, you know, like in a way that could uh, um, better optimize resources. Uh, say, IOM improves one thing, or improves another thing, like and other organizations improve other things that speak together. Uh, could potentially be, be done beyond the realm of the the geek collaboration. Um, uh, I would like this in this reduction. Would uh, wanted to mention that I think that competition and duplication in terms of resources is not only a bad thing. Like competition also has made the humanitarian system evolve and catch up in terms of efficiencies, um, create uh, enormous and very efficient in initiatives. And duplication could be uh, a way to, if better planned, uh, to actually have uh, more statistical confidence in, in some of the results that we have. Lastly, in terms of principles, uh, and here uh, connecting with Annalisa, I think a lack of uh, coordination and this uh, and the lack of guiding standards um, are, are uh, a, a real threat for uh, for humanitarianism. So it would be very uh, useful for us to think uh, about uh, these ongoing initiatives uh, around ethics, protection, etc. But also uh, an overall recognition that there are so many different areas of data that. Uh, are so far disconnected and we will certainly affect principles um, through that. I will stop okay. here, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Nuno. Um, all right, we're just going to move now into a moderated discussion between the panelists. So guys, I will be throwing some questions at you from the concept note, you know, that has the content of the panel. Um, I'll try and balance the time between everybody, but we are already significantly over time. So apologies in advance if I can't get to you. Um, so let's get into it. After this moderated discussion, uh, we'll have some statements from the floor. During the moderated discussion, please keep your comments to two minutes. Again, keeping it really tight. Uh, and I may ask more than one of you to respond to the same question. Um, so the first one is circling back to Godfrey and Nuno, you may have some comments on this, um, but for you, Godfrey, you spoke about data gaps, you know, so here's a follow up question that came to mind that, you know, also features kind of in the content of the concept behind this panel. So my question for you, and again, this expands a bit into what the other panelists were saying, but particularly Nuno in coordination, what are the consequences? who is accountable and who's penalized when there are data gaps um, and how do we balance that with ensuring safe effective and responsible data collection and data governance you know within the complexity of these responses um, so again it's who who suffers you know and who pays due to data gaps and do you see any opportunities to close those gaps as we move forward godfrey we'll start with you thanks Absolutely, and thank you, Sandra, for that. Um, when there are data gaps, unfortunately, uh, it is it is the people who uh, find themselves, uh, you know, in 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 crises that suffer uh, at the end of the day, uh, and and that is why you know we should always uh, keep that at the back of the uh, of our minds when we are um, addressing these issues around um, uh, around data gaps. Uh, and who is accountable for for these uh, for these gaps? Uh, and I think it is all of us uh, around uh, around the table, um, in our different um, um, uh, organizations, and different spheres of work. Uh, I think we um, we have to resort just only accountability just for the uh, for for the data, but you know. Uh, it extends beyond that really and putting it back to the to the people in crisis where, where we we are saying we're being accountable to the people in crisis through being more accountable uh, for the 
uh, for the data gaps that are um, that 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 we see. Um, I will end uh, here. Um, uh, and yeah, and, and, and pass over maybe to to Nuno uh, as you mentioned. That maybe you can come in with any additions uh, there. Yeah, Nuno, uh, particularly interested to hear from you <laughs> on data gaps from a coordination perspective. Um, having um, been a coordinator, you know, not having information can have implications for funding and implications for appropriate and timely action. So please go ahead. Uh, sure, I uh, would add to what Godfrey mentioned that uh, building on that, like in some cases from a coordination perspective, there may be a reason for a data gap. So um, there may be is either like uh, for the country, there are other priorities or um, the information may also be too sensitive to to be collected so in some cases when we make like a it's that's the difference between making a global analysis versus like the reasoning for a particular selection of data that is collected for a certain country um but in any case yes like uh, uh advocacy to to have more information such as visibility of people displaced by conflict in some uh, particularly uh, difficult context we are dealing with right now uh, represent one of those gaps uh, from which uh, people themselves would suffer first. Thanks, Nuno. Uh, my next question is for Annalisa. Uh, and this is kind of gathering bits from what you spoke to the first time around. Uh, and this is really around the fact that we're now in an age where data sovereignty, data ownership is increasingly relevant, but that, you know, responsible data handling doesn't always apply. Um, or that there can be actors and stakeholders that are unaware of those types of violations because of a tyranny of the system, because of the immense demand for transparency and data. So my question for you is what are your thoughts on the dynamics of power, agency, and choice between those needing and requesting the data, those analyzing the data versus those individuals that it's collected from. Um, what sorts of tools and practices in your experience tell us what to do and what not to do when it comes to this? Over Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. So, um, I think what we always have to keep in mind is that we need there needs to be the purpose. We need to collect data that we need. So over collection of data is often, we often feel and go in the direction of, well, let's collect everything and then we'll see what to do with it. And I think the, the, the paradigm needs to shift to thinking, okay, what do I need data for? And then that defines what we need to collect. And obviously there are different levels. So at a, at a macro kind of coordination level, we're going to need aggregate data. Um, so how do we agree? Um, how do we agree on what are those indicators? What is those data points that we need that we can all collect so that it can feed into having that broad picture? Um, and how can that help then? You know, how can that how can the coordination inform the data and then the data support that coordination? And it goes both ways. Um, but then you get down to the lower level. So when you're looking at service delivery, when you're looking at actual program design, um, and you're looking at individuals' data, and that becomes a lot more sensitive, and that requires a lot more control. You're you're talking about people's. You're talking about. We're talking about people's lives. We're talking about potentially d harm that could be done. We're talking about life or death in some situations. So it needs. We need to be very very careful. Violence, etc. So looking at how we can, again, how do we coordinate as response agencies, as service delivery agencies around what data we're gonna collect, what mechanisms, what, what uh, protocols, what protections we're gonna put in place in order to protect the data that we, that we collect, in order to protect the data subjects as the primary and owners of their information. And that's, I think, the thing that needs to be, that we need to remember. We are, we are holding it on their behalf that is their information, it is their data. And if they want us to delete it, we have to. If they want us to do something with it, we must respect their consent and we must respect their wishes. And I think that's the primary thing that needs to be 
Um, and I, consent is consent is hard. Um, it's very difficult to comprehend, although it's such a simple concept. And we all expect it when we give information, and therefore we need to respect that same wish when we are collecting information uh, from clients. Um, and I think, again, at the service delivery piece, there is a, a piece around how what are the levels of information that we can share in order to provide those services? And how do we ensure that that consent, that the power of that consent is given to that individual so that they are the ones that agree, yes, please share my information so that I can get a health service. Yes, please share my information so that my asylum procedure can, can be processed. But if, if I haven't been asked to share my, if I've been asked to share my, my data for health, but not for the asylum, it cannot automatically, that consent cannot automatically be used for a third or a different, um, a different sharing. And I think it's really important that there are agreements, protocols, information sharing agreements at whatever level is required within the response piece in order to respect and in order to ensure that uh, that we're not doing any harm at the end of the day and that we're respecting the confidentiality and the consent of the individuals. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Annalisa. I might spin that question a little bit for you, Kendra. Um, just coming from that local responder field-based perspective and acknowledging that, you know, as Annalisa has pointed out, informed consent is not that easy. It does require sometimes extra work from us as humanitarians to make sure that we're not just custodians, but we are helping people with informed consent so that that consent is truly informed, you know, and that sometimes requires going the last mile, sensitizing, sensitizing government stakeholders. So my question to you, Kendra, is that we live in this kind of infodemic between COVID-19, the demands of the humanitarian data ecosystem, the misinformation and the distrust of data systems like Facebook that people may have. Can you speak a little bit to the field and local responder experience and perspective on informed consent? Um, and what do you think we can learn from the diversity of content, context relevant approaches to getting informed consent and the need to share locally versus the need to report data collectively? Sandra, I'm, there's a lot in that question. Um, and I, I guess, for um, for me, it really starts with uh, local contextual knowledge and um, being uh, aware of the populations that we are serving, um, particularly after a humanitarian crisis has occurred, when um, everyone is in some level of chaos, both the responders as well as those who have been impacted. And so that that's why, for example, um, in Vanuatu, uh, World Vision chooses only to respond to communities with whom we abide in non-crisis times and um, to ensure that we always have a staff member that speaks the local language. Um, I think Vanuatu is kind of particular in this um, instance because even though it's such a small country, there are over 120 uh, live languages. And so um, we're often dealing with um, multilingual populations that are functionally illiterate. And so um, we, it, first of all, that, that trusting relationship whereby after a disaster has occurred, um, they see a, a, a World Vision staff member coming into the community, they know that staff member by name and the staff member knows the community uh, well, and um, that for initial assessments provides um, excellent um, information on a on a basic assessment level for um, you know damaged crops, damaged households, um, and then when we're talking about individual informed consent, um, that's of course a process that we need to follow. Um, Every time we take a photo or, or every time we um, gather data, whether that is after a humanitarian crisis or um, as part of a longer term development initiative. And so 
a lot of the community members with whom we work are, are familiar with the process and we've developed sort of pictorial consent forms so that um, people understand whether, you, you know, how a photo might be used, whether they might see their photo of their child on Facebook um, at some point. Um, and uh, so they're used to the process. And so it's easier to get that genuine, um, true informed consent after a disaster because there already is a trusting relationship, um, it, you know, based on, on a, a, a longer term engagement. I think um, in terms of, uh, you know, data use, um, I, this is one that we struggle with because often we're very aware that the people with whom we're working don't understand the development environment, don't understand academia, don't understand the value of the types of data we're collecting to inform the quality of future responses or future development programs. And um, that can be very difficult to explain. Um, to someone that has a very localized worldview. And so, um, you know, we're still working on that and still investigating solutions. But until then, we never use the data for anything that we have not received explicit permission um, because that would break down trust. And that trust is the foundation of consent. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's so interesting to start to understand the human side, you know, of the data ecosystem and the fact that things like trust, you know, in the field with communities is a core part of data quality of informed consent, you know, but is not quantifiable, you know, in and of itself. Um, nevertheless, what we do try to do is kind of aggregate and quantify the data that we do have in order to feed this ecosystem uh, and be globally transparent. Uh, so thanks a lot to all of the panelists, really, really rich responses and discussion. We'll now be moving to take some statements from the floor from our institutional partners. We will be beginning with Chelsea Borman, who is a humanitarian program specialist for the United States mission to the United Nations. Chelsea, you'll have two minutes to make some remarks. Please remember to press, I believe it's star six on your phone to unmute. Uh, of course, we will not be putting you on video because you are calling in. Chelsea, over to you. Hi, uh, hello everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you so much for hosting the event. This has been truly a very fascinating discussion. As the largest single humanitarian donor, the United States has a longstanding history of providing life-saving assistance and supporting dozens of partners and UN agencies and local organizations to strengthen the humanitarian data ecosystem. The United States has also been actively developing new technologies, both in the private sector and the government. Um, so for example, we launched the city's COVID mitigation mapping program which builds on global networks of geospatial experts to analyze the second order impacts of COVID-19, helping us to better understand the gaps in resources available to vulnerable populations in urban communities. Um, as high resolution satellite imagery has become available more broadly, we can now use it as well for disaster planning and event monitoring, including forecasting the paths of hurricanes and combating flooding and drought. We are also proud to support the World Bank UNHCR Joint Data Center on Forced Displacement, which promises to make humanitarian and development action in situations of forced displacement more data-driven and evidence-informed. So from our perspective as well, we believe that the international humanitarian community must advance the following data ecosystem components. Bolstering the humanitarian workforce's capability to use data in decision-making processes including emphasizing greater data literacy and humanitarian talent pipeline. Uh, we also believe in the importance of establishing a highly functional humanitarian data leadership steering committee that is representative of the humanitarian community. Um, we believe in building evidence, understanding, and consensus around the ethical and effective 
um, artificial intelligence and machine learning use cases, as well as data privacy and security standards. Uh, we also um, um, believe in improving the humanitarian data ecosystem by adopting common humanitarian data standards, humanitarian crisis identifiers, and application programming interfaces to allow automated use between systems and ensuring key data is available in reasonable formats. And lastly, also the importance in ensuring humanitarian decisions at all levels are grounded in data and evidence. Um, just a few other points to note. Um, obviously, the internet and social media have greatly enhanced the ability to quickly access information for analysis. Um, however, this also pre presents challenges of reliability and disinformation, of course. That's why trusted websites such as the UN's Relief Web and Humanitarian Data Exchange play such a crucial role. Um, as well as just to know that the over-reliance, of course, on technology also increases the risk of technical failures and site disruption. But lastly, I just wanted to reinforce and thank you all for this conversation. It's clear that we need to advance efforts to effectively invest in data collection and data sharing infrastructure. The United States is happy to be part of this discussion and will continue to support coordinated efforts to provide the world's most vulnerable populations with principled and evidence-based humanitarian assistance. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Uh, we'll now move over to the second statement to the floor from an institutional partner. This is from Jonas Bellina, who is a diplomatic officer with the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, Jonas, if you are calling in by phone, again, please press star six uh, and we'll provide you two minutes to give a statement to the floor. Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished moderator, distinguished panelists. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, so, first of all, uh, I would like to thank the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data, the International Organization of Migration, the International Rescue Committee, and Emerging Impact for this very insightful discussion. Switzerland commends your leading work in the development of a responsible, secure, and ethical humanitarian data ecosystem. And on behalf of Switzerland, I would like to um, emphasize that data that has been collected exclusively for humanitarian purposes must be respected and protected. This is key amongst others for the following two reasons. First of all, the trust of the people they serve is a precondition uh, for uh, humanitarian organizations to carry out uh, their humanitarian work. And this trust uh, can only be earned if affected people know that their data is respected and protected. Secondly, only by respecting and protecting humanitarian data, states can strengthen the mandate of humanitarian organizations to carry out their crucial work. And um, as we have heard in today's discussion, as well as in yesterday's high-level panel on innovation, um, we we, we saw that uh, the use of uh, new technologies and digital data in humanitarian action comes with tremendous opportunities. At the same time, however, we need to make every effort to minimize associated risks for affected people. It is clear that no individual organization or state can tackle these challenges alone. And having realized that, and to foster collective action, the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data, the ICRC, and Switzerland have jointly launched the Humanitarian Data and Trust Initiative for the Protection and Responsible Use of Humanitarian Data last year. This initiative has four uh, aims. First, to accelerate the responsible deployment of data-related technologies in humanitarian action. Second, to minimize potential risks and maximize benefits for affected people arising from data-related technologies. Third, to develop shared principles and guidelines and build consensus among participating states and humanitarian organizations on how to support and practice responsible data management and last but not least, to build trust between parties through dialogue and transparency. These four goals should uh, be reached uh, via four pillars, which is policy and dialogue, research and development, as well as education and outreach. In the first step with this initiative, we have focused on the responsible sharing of data between humanitarian organizations and states. 
We are very grateful for the valuable engagement of states and organizations in this endeavor. It is only through collective action that we can make a difference for affected people. I thank you. All right, thank you so much, Jonas. Um, some really good points on responsibility uh, and of course on the type of technology that we have. Um, so now we'll be going to take questions from the floor. So Q and A, this is, we do have some technical issues today. So I'll first ask those attendees that were able to join WebEx, please enter your questions into the chat. Um, and for our lovely behind the scenes manager, Kareem, uh, I'd like to maybe take a bit of a leap of faith and ask if we can unmute those who are calling in to see if anybody calling in has a specific question. Again, those calling in need to press star six in order to be able to reply. So I'll give that about 60 seconds. So one minute uh, to be taking those questions. And if we don't get them, then I definitely have some more questions for discussion across the panel. Uh, so please drop your questions or get ready to ask your question by phone and press star six. Sandra, I've unmuted everybody, but uh, because it's uh, phone dialing, folks who want to speak by phone, you're going to have to reconfirm that you are unmuted by pressing star six on your phone. Otherwise, I think, Sandra, you can continue with the, the questions that we have. But uh, people who are dialed in, you should be able to hit the asterisk or stars and then six if you want to unmute your phone and ask a question. Over. And of course, if you've already done so, please ask your question now. I can see that we have one, two, three, four, five. We've got at least 10 people calling in by phone who are unmuted. Do you have any questions for us? This is becoming more of like a radio show at this point. Um, but if I don't get any questions in the, the next 30 seconds, then I'm just going to pick up questions for the panel. So any takers, last call. All right, so it seems a little problematic. Um, apologies to everyone. Uh, so I'm just going to jump in. Just gonna jump into some key questions for our panelists here. Um, I do have a question and, you know, I'm gonna throw these questions out to all panelists. If you guys don't mind playing classroom and just raising your hand if you have a response to that question. If nobody raises their hands, I will be calling on you. Um, that might sound familiar from a long time ago for some of us. Um, but I have a question for everybody around, you know, the layering of data, what technology kind of allows us to do today in the area of predictive analytics. So I know this is something that the OHS Center for Humanitarian Data has worked on. I know that um, some of the other panelists here have worked on it before um, and you know just sharing an example from my experience I do remember being in a response and having gotten the paper maps of hurricanes you know for the last 10 years in order to try and create you know a priority and risk area mapping for cluster partners in a food security cluster and I really would have loved to have some predictive analytics there you know because it really is a game of triangulation of data so are there any panelists that already have experience working on predictive analytics and can you define what that is and the potential of that to really accelerate humanitarian action and the collection and sharing of data for first responders and decision makers? Anyone? All right, go for it, Godfrey. Uh, thank you, and that's a really, really uh, uh, in 
interesting area uh, for us uh, in the center. So, uh, as I mentioned, one of our four uh, focus areas is actually on on, on predictive uh, analytics. And I'll just give an example, maybe just to make it more real of, of some of the work that we we would do around uh, anticipatory action. So we are able to, uh, and we've been you know taking um, uh, making inroads into being more anticipatory rather than reactive in responding to to humanitarian crisis, um, and using uh, adv these advanced uh, data science techniques and uh, um, uh, predictive analytics to anticipate uh, the. Uh, the next uh, crisis before it happen, uh, before it happens, and and this has been really been used uh, in very concrete terms in, uh, in, in the surf, um, in, the, in the allocation of surf funding uh, uh, around uh, flooding uh, in um, uh, in, a, in in several uh, location um, contexts where these uh, predictive analytics. Uh, uh, pilots have been um, have been uh, initiated uh, by uh, by OCHA and the humanitarian uh, communities, uh, the humanitarian uh, community in those uh, in those uh, locations. So we have been uh, finding a lot of uh, success um, um, in, in that, and there's been a funding that has already been uh, triggered as a result of. Uh, having uh, detected these triggers before they, uh, especially around flooding, before the flooding, before uh, the flooding has uh, has actually uh, hit, and, and that has led to much faster uh, allocation of funding, uh, which has all uh, the, um, which has also allowed for much faster response to take place, and ultimately uh, saving uh, uh, more lives uh, and saving more uh, resources in the uh, in the process. Thanks a lot, Godfrey. Um, so speaking around, you know, this idea of technology where it's brought us so far and things like predictive analytics, um, but also what sorts of emerging technologies, this is my area of work, that, you know, kind of intersect with this humanitarian data ecosystem. And so one of the technologies that I work on in particular is blockchain technology. And blockchain is a very large global database essentially um, that is in the cloud that allows you to create actionable data so you're able to attach algorithms to things like transactional data um, or other data that may require steps before becoming actionable and that really allows you to do things like you know automate a cash transfer system based on the results of risk mapping or predictive analytics so that if somebody knows a cyclone is heading their way, then the cash disbursement system is actually integrated, you know, with the database that includes that registration information as well as the information on areas at risk. However, doing this work, one of the things that I've noticed is that we need to be a little bit introspective and humble about our sector. You know, aside from you guys on the panel who are, you know, on the, this panel because you're great with data, we have some serious upskilling to do when it comes to the use of emerging technologies and even around the area of data science and data competencies within the sector and the extent to which we're able to build those competencies on the ground for local stakeholders in a response so that we don't have international agencies stepping in each time. So even though the tech makes things more accessible, we need to do a lot of work in terms of human capacity to get there. Um, so I'd really like to hear from some of the panelists on what do you feel are the gaps for us within the sector, you know, for workers from the field level all the way up to the global level to be able to engage responsibly with data and technology going forward. Any takers? Again, just raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Kendra, go for it. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, I think. One major issue is that um, often data from the field is aggregated up and never comes back down. And um, a lot of the data technology that is being developed um, ends up uh, only being accessible to those who have uh, 
regular connections to the internet or um, a certain level of formal education so that they're able to understand that. And so we, we spend a lot of time trying to translate that data back down, but the data doesn't even come and, and reach um, me all, all the time um, and, and my colleagues at the national level. So I think getting that data loop um, going is a really important thing in terms of transparency and accountability. Um, and, and I think I'd just like to make a comment in terms of new technologies as well. Um, Chelsea Gorman mentioned that, uh, you know, USAID has been working on using satellite mapping and, and a lot of those um, more widely available uh, emerging technologies in order to support humanitarian data. And that actually has ended up being one of the biggest tools in the in the Pacific um, that has been useful for some predictive analytics. And um, there are tools like Tupaya, T-U-P-A-I-A, which is an innovative platform that looks at health trends um, in this area of the world using a lot of that layering GIS and satellite technology. Um, and, and has been uh, really groundbreaking in the field of health. And so I, I really think that those technologies are often accessible to anyone who knows how to use a smartphone and has intermittent access to the internet. Thanks, Kendra. Um, some really great points there. And also reminding you know everybody who's listening that Oftentimes, even in places like Vanuatu, even in very remote environments, we need to be aware of the extent to which the communities we work with have access to other data using technology. You know, and so there may be a perception around this positive feedback loop of why can I get more information on Facebook about this response than the agency that is supporting me is actually giving me. Right, so really making an effort to create these feedback loops and acknowledging to what extent people do engage with technology, even if it's on their friend's phone once a week, you know, for example. Um, I did see that Annalisa and Nuno had their hands up. Did you guys want to provide any final comments? We'll then move into wrapping up. So I do want to give you a chance if you wanted to weigh in on those questions. I just wanted to kind of, uh, I just wanted to kind of um, build on what um, Kendra was saying um, in relation to um, as, as part of that uh, kind of moving the data back down uh, to the to the staff is also that that really strong investment in um, in data literacy and in training uh, the staff that are meant to be using and generating that data as well as the participants, the communities on the why, why the data collection needs to take place, what we're asking questions for, um, and, and that to, so that, so that that information, and that we then bring that information back, not just to our teams and the service providers, but actually back to the community to inform them of why, why decisions were made, how we use their information to inform a program design, to inform a specific response and engage them as part of, and engage their participation in defining that response. And I think it's really crucial to, to, use, to use the data we collect from communities to then work with communities to define what the response will be. Um, obviously it depends on, you know, the, 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 the type of um, emergency response, the stage and how we kind of engage them, but it's really crucial to invest in that training um, at, at all levels. Thank you. Thanks, Annalisa. All right, we'll now move into some of the final statements. So for each panelist, we're gonna give you one minute to just sum up, you know, what are the key takeaways that you want to provide to the audience? around this topic. Um, I'll be giving you one minute each, so we'll be keeping it tight. Keep an eye on your chat. If you're going over time, I will let you know, and I'll then conclude with a wrap-up message, um, and we'll let everybody be on their way. So, final statements, beginning with Godfrey. Would you like to make a final statement to the floor? Thanks.
Thank you very much, uh, and I'll be very brief. So, um, uh, the final takeaway I would like to to, to leave people with uh, participants to, to with today is that you know, when we were talking about data gaps, uh, um, yes, there are data gaps, but uh, in talking about them, uh, we would like to advocate for you know for the filling of those gaps and. With the state of humanitarian data reports that we released um, uh, early this year, we've already seen an uptick in the data availability following efforts uh, from from that advocacy and working with our uh, with our partners uh, in the field to 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 fill those data gaps. And I would just like to uh, you know uh, encourage uh, and call upon um, um, uh, uh, participants who have you know. In influence in 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 one way or, or another in filling up in, in filling these uh, data gaps to get in touch with uh, with us at the center uh, and on HDX to see how we can work together to help fill those uh, data gaps so data can be used to um, uh, to provide better outcomes for people uh, um, affected by crisis. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Godfrey. Uh, moving along in order. Well, maybe less in order. We'll now move on to Annalisa. Uh, do you want to give us some wrap-up comments for the crowd, please? Um, sure. Thank you very much. So I think by utilizing and facilitating systems that produce safe, ethical, and actionable data uh, within kind of interagency governed systems. So this means systems that are created for and governed by multiple actors and really including within that at the minimum, those frontline service providers, we could easily generate safe, aggregate and anonymized data that can be shared um, across systems and that can then be used um, to, to improve and inform programming. So I think just to kind of, as a takeaway, is just three things that this will require are standardized forms or a common minimum data set. Um, and from there, developing common indicators uh, on program outputs that can then be scaled to multiple organizations and used across the entire sector. And then really that sector commitment to use this data. So, you know, um, this is what makes it safe and actionable. And this effort needs to be shared across the sector. It's not enough for each of us to go at it alone. So with these three pieces in place, we could easily share this aggregate anonymized indicators um, so that actors can use you know, different interagency platforms um, to share the data and use that to, to inform um, programming, to triangulate for further interpretation, et cetera. And having these features in a system that is governed by an interagency group that includes frontline service providers, UN agencies, et cetera, means it is sustainable, scalable, and it is usable by the entire sector. Um, and most importantly, it is built by the practitioners that use it most. Thank you. Excellent. I really love that idea. Hopefully we'll get there someday. <laughs> All right, over to you, Nuno. Thank you. Um, I think that as a final message, maybe uh, to ask um, some reflection on data as a, a very broad group of disciplines that are interconnected and somehow um, to one of the interventions uh, when we consider uh, that data collected for humanitarian purposes must be respected and protected. Um, once it is shared, uh, it's difficult for us as humanitarians to ensure that the user will respect it. Um, and in that case, then we enter like in some cycle of contradictions that only a good coordination between us uh, may help to improve and define in terms of standards. What is that um, sharing versus uh, the, the, the potential benefit or harm caused to colleagues. Uh, a last one on uh, perhaps asking or inviting participants that haven't read yet uh, the ISC guidance on uh, data responsibility to do so, uh, because uh, it is a very, very useful document. Excellent. Thanks, Nunal. Always begging kind of this question of 
who watches the watchers, you know, or who guards the guards, you know, to go back to this old Roman proverb, um, and who ultimately is responsible and where does that responsibility, that responsibility reach its limits. Um, okay, Kendra, over to you for a closing statement, and then I'll start wrapping us up. Go ahead. Thanks, Sandra. So I think building on that idea of who guards the guards, um, understanding uh, not only the international uh, data ecosystem, but the local data ecosystem in which um, one is working and responding is essential. And that also means understanding the legislation around protection of data, as well as the people that will be providing the data and the level at which they can engage with um, certain data sharing concepts. And so, you know, in order to fill some of those data gaps that we've been talking about and to produce safe and actionable data, coordination really is key, but that coordination may look different uh, at each uh, country level. And that coordination must include really strong data feedback loops to all partners and uh, strong relationships of trust and integrity, not only between those in the coordination mechanism, but with those from whom we're collecting the data. All right, thanks so much, Kendra. Um, as a wrap up statement, you know, maybe a call to action that's, you know, also along my line of work, having been in the sector, the humanitarian sector, and now at this intersection of technology. I mean, for me, part of this call to action as we're looking forward, you know, into the humanitarian data ecosystem and the innovations we have are that you know, as agencies from local all the way up to global, that we really should be looking at digitizing and innovating humanitarian data ecosystems for localization. You know, and when I say this, it's really about keeping in mind these power dynamics that need to shift. The extent to which as data is more and more decentralized, power itself can become more and more decentralized. Um, so thinking about how we can empower local counterparts with the opportunity to really engage in shaping the future of their agency and level of participation in these ecosystems. I think it's something that Kendra has just touched on. Annalisa, everybody on this panel understands the value of that first responder who has that deep knowledge of context. And what I'd really like to see as we go forward, and I think we should all prioritize, is making sure that that knowledge of context and that value as a local responder is embedded in the way that we innovate, is embedded in the way that we shape new tools, um, multi-agency sharing, coordination systems that may take different shapes and forms in different countries. Um, and I also think that we should invest accordingly, even if that means going in the extra mile, the extra digital mile, or the extra mile in terms of data literacy, digital literacy informed consent as a process rather than as an output in and of itself. Um, so really, at the end of the day, I think that innovating and democratizing these data ecosystems and bridging the digital divide are going to become increasingly interlinked. Um, and that's a responsibility that we do need to take on, you know, rather than just creating new tools that without giving people the opportunity to participate in that process. Um, or without thinking about the capacities of people to be able to use those tools, again, from the local all the way up to the global. Um, so with that, I'll thank everybody. Thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, this has been an excellent panel, honestly. Um, again, apologies to the audience that we had some technical issues. This will be posted as a video on YouTube. Um, and Kareem, of course, will be in touch with all of those who registered to be able to access that video. And of course, thank you so much to the OCHA Center for Humanitarian Data, the International Organization for Migration, and the International Rescue Committee as co-sponsors for this event. And thanks to the audience for being really patient with us, attending by, help, by phone and sometimes attending online. Um, we hope this has given you guys some new perspectives and some food for thought as you continue to engage in the humanitarian space. So thank you to everybody. Uh, have a great rest of your day, or in our case, in Vanuatu, a great rest of your night. Thanks. Goodbye.
Thank you.